So Cindy, uh, I just wanted to officially welcome you to the CEO's chair. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, you've had a lot of your, your fans and people that interact with you uh, sign up and log in from all over the world. So there are very few people on here that don't really know who you are. Uh, but for those a few that are there that I just wanted to give a brief profile uh, of, uh, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to sum up 60 years of, of experience in a, a couple of lines, but I'll try my best. Uh, you're currently the founder and CEO of If We Ran the World and Make Love Not Porn Companies. Um, you're also a board advisor and investor in multiple other companies as well. I'm not, uh, not an investor, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm okay. a board advisor. You're a board advisor. Yeah. Uh, you also have almost uh, or close to three decades of experience in the advertising and marketing industries. Uh, you were a former awardee of Advertising Women of the Year, um, eldest of four sisters, and an extremely passionate uh, speaker and advocate on diversity and women leaders. I, I hope I got all of that right. Yep, yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, so, Cindy, first of all, uh, I know that you know, you're, you're, you're a native, new, native of New York. You've lived in New York for the last couple of decades almost. Um, it's, how are you holding up between you know, the, the COVID-19 and, uh, of course, the protests that are going on? Sure. Well, I mean, um, I personally have been in lockdown in my apartment for the past three months. Okay. Um, I only leave it once a week to do a mm. very quick grocery run um, because um, New York City itself um, is still in lockdown um, in the context okay. of the pandemic. At the same time, obviously, um, over the past week, mm -hmm. we've had some very distressing events um, uh, related to racism and police brutality. And so at the same time, um, I'm happy to say that New York City is rallying around and protesting every day and every night. Um, I, I personally am not out on the streets because at the age of 60, having been in lockdown for three months, um, I obviously am concerned about COVID, which is still an issue. Um, but I'm very glad that a lot of people, um, including a lot of younger people, less likely to be impacted by it, are absolutely out there demonstrating um, to protest the appalling death of George Floyd and to really um, challenge everyone to end racism in this country once and for all, so that the spirit of New York is alive and well. That's, that's really good to hear, Cindy. Um, you're somebody that advises a lot of organizations on diversity initiatives, uh, marketing initiatives, and so on. Um, what exactly are you telling your, the organizations that you're talking to? I mean, I don't think that there is any coming out of this uh, normally, right? A lot of changes yeah. will have to be uh, taken into consideration. What can organizations do differently or better, uh, according to you? Uh, absolutely. So um, I'll address that um, related to Black Lives Matter first and then the pandemic second. And when it comes to ending racism, mm -hmm. um, the, the message that I have been um, putting out um, on social media and in my speaking and interviewing um, consistently is that for every brand, company, and agency who is currently posting in support of Black Lives Matter, um, there is only one thing they need to do, and it's very simple. They need to ensure and then demonstrate publicly that they have full Black representation on their leadership team and at every single level of their company. And they need to ensure and then show that black talent is just as welcomed, hired, promoted, championed, celebrated, valued, compensated, bonus, rewarded, and gets to thrive in their company just as much as white talent does. Okay. And in my view, that is the only thing that companies and brands should be focusing on right now. The point being that when you do that, a huge amount of change happens as a result Correct. because then you are absolutely hiring and promoting and paying black talent as you should. You are building up the black economy. Um, black people are massively disadvantaged here in the US in all sorts of ways because of systemic institutional racism. You are role modeling black professionals. Um, you are giving them their rightful place within the corporate structure, you are enabling them to thrive in a way that then inspires younger black people and students and children. Um, you know, to, I've been saying, again, very straightforwardly, 
you know, any company going, oh, you know, let's have a really diverse internship program in place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many black people you bring in at the bottom if you show them nowhere to go at the top. And so my message to leadership and management is hire into equal power with you, brilliant black men and women that you feel threatened by. And when you do that in every industry, um, you know, especially in my industry, marketing and advertising, of course, what you then do is you ensure advertising that is created through the black lens, directed through the black lens, produced through the black lens, cast through the black lens, um, that then models aspirational culture mm -hmm. in a way that, um, because advertising is a very powerful force in popular culture, of in course. a way that then changes society's attitudes and behavior. So, so that is the single thing that every single brand company agency should do. Correct. Pulling out of that, um, that is helped at the same time by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Because obviously all around us, um, and in India equally, we are seeing the very tragic impact globally. True. And in amongst all of that tragedy, um, I'm a great believer that adversity drives opportunity. The pandemic is ensuring the world will never be the same again. And that is very good news for those of us who are never the status quo to begin with. Correct. Because it is only when everything breaks down this utterly and completely, new models and new ways of doing things emerge that never would have otherwise. And so the opportunity for all companies and all mm -hmm. individuals right now is that there are two dynamics at play. First of all, there is a dynamic of the change the pandemic is making happen as we speak, mm -hmm. which is the complete breakdown of the old world order. And then on top of that, there is a dynamic of what each one of us seizes the opportunity for and leverages on top of that. Correct. And so I'm encouraging everybody right now to take this moment and envision the world you want to live and work in and then go out there and make it happen because finally, right now, you can. Thank you. Uh, you actually answered part of my next question, which was going to be that what can individuals or leaders or people that are heading their own companies do to make the change? Um, and I think you, you put it very well. Right. Uh, to, uh, and I want to add one point to that, actually, if, of course. if I may, which is, um, and um, I say this because I know that out there around the world are many, many people mm -hmm. who have been massively negatively financially impacted by this. Of course. There are people who've lost jobs, mm -hmm. people who can't find work, you know, freelancers who've lost contracts, founders whose businesses are going under, um, you know, to, um, leaders of large businesses who are looking at very challenging times. And for, um, for the, all the people um, who are, you know, out of work, um, looking to find work, um, have a job currently and are worried about keeping it, um, I want to just give the um, one piece of advice that, that I've always given to, um, historically to individuals within companies. Um, which, you know, in, in more stable times, I've characterized this as if you're working anywhere, this is the single thing to do that will propel you fastest up the career ladder. Okay. This is the single thing you do that will turbocharge your ascent into the C-suite. This is the single thing you do that will instantly put you on the fast track to promotion and award. And it's very simply this understand how your company makes money and recommend more ways to make more money. Just doing that one thing will guarantee your job, ensure you're kept on. These days, if you are looking for work, mm -hmm. research the hell out of the company you want to work for because right. every company is struggling. Identify how they make money, understand how they make money, recommend ways to make more money. And I want to take that piece of advice and extrapolate it out to founders and leaders of businesses. Because now is the time um, to do something that again, I've been exhorting for years, which is to redesign your business model. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I've observed for far too long, people thinking one of two things, either this is our industry business model, this is the only way our industry has ever made money. This is the only way our industry ever will make money. Or they think there is a set number of business models out there and we have to operate one of those. And 
neither is true because your business model can be anything you want it to be. And in fact, a really good starting point when you want to redesign your business model Mm -hmm. is to blue sky it and to ask yourself, how would I like to make money? How would we as a company like to make money? Because it's a safe bet you'd like to make it differently to the way you've been making it historically or the way you're making it currently. And so now is the opportunity when everything is broken down to also completely rethink your business model and the way you make money Because when you open up your thinking, you can find whole new opportunities in this new reality that we are now living in. Absolutely. And and Cindy, I think this ties in very well with you have one consistent message across all your communication, all your social media. I've been following you now for a couple of years and it's it's stayed exactly the same. That you like to take things and break them down and then, of course, build them back up. Um, this is a very status quo challenging mindset. And I'm, I don't know how long you've had it. And obviously it's been very successful for you for a very long time. But was there a moment in time or was there a, almost like a catalyst moment uh, when you went from being a very traditional mindset to a, a, a very, you know, Michael Bay mindset where you <laughs> like to blow things up? Um, no, to, um, no, I mean, to, I mean th- th- there were no, um, you know, turning points. Um, okay. I mean, I mean, I've been lucky in my career in advertising mm-hmm. um, to always work for very innovative and disruptive agencies, um, okay. especially the agency that I spent most time at, my 16 years at Bartle Bogle Hegarty, BBH. Correct. And um, I, I guess what, what I would say um, in answer to your question is, um, you, you know, actually, one of the things that did frustrate me in my mm-hmm. years in the corporate advertising world Mm-hmm. was that, you know, at BBH, um, we had phenomenal breakthrough ideas and cutting edge thinking. But within an agency, those ideas were always at the mercy of our clients' appetite for risk, sure. our clients' budgets, you know, our clients' willingness to mm-hmm. make those leaps. And so um, it was basically when I left the corporate world in 2005 to work mm-hmm. with myself. So that's 15 years ago now. Um, actually, that was the point at which I went, actually, now I can have whatever ideas I want and I can make them happen myself. And so I really try and encourage people to shift their mindsets both within and outside mm-hmm. of the corporate culture because many people um, are bound by convention and the status quo in a way they don't even realize. Correct. And we all benefit when we do not accept the status quo. You know, one of my favorite quotes of all time is Alan Kay, who said, in order to predict the future, you have to invent it. I am all about inventing the future. Too many people think the future is something that happens without us, rolls us over in its wake. And I'm all about decide what you want the future to be and then make it happen because you absolutely can. No, and I, and I love that uh, quote. Uh, but you've, you've, and I'd like to dwell on this a little bit longer if, if that's okay. You work in the corporate world. Um, you know how difficult it is for somebody, especially a woman leader, to challenge the status quo from within. Um, I had a lot of women reach out to me when, you know, when I uh, shared your profile on social media um, because yes, a lot of them want to make a difference but like we, unfortunately, and I don't want to equate it to, to racism or lack of diversity, but everybody's concerned about their own career path as well. Um, so is there a happy balance that can be found? Um, so um, it's very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, what I say to women, to black people, to people mm-hmm. of color, to LGBTQ, to disabled people, all those of us who are other, um, is start your own industry. And what I mean by that is mm. start your own business. Okay. Um, but I articulate it in that manner because when, when anybody who is othered within the status quo starts their own business, effectively what you are doing is you are starting your own industry. Sure. You are starting the industry that we all want to live and work in. And, and you know, there is a huge opportunity for women, black people, um, again, anybody who is other to do that, um, because, because it's precisely because you are not the status quo that you will be able to see opportunities the status quo can't. Okay. And so I recommend to anybody working in a company at the moment, in an incident mm-hmm. moment, whatever it is, 
take a long, hard look around you and identify what you think is missing that should be there. What you think wish existed in your industry that nobody else is bringing to the table, what you would love to have happen that you think you can uniquely made happen, and then start that. Because not only will you, by doing that, have identified a genuine need and mm -hmm. a market gap that you can fill, when you start that business, and when you prove it can work, and quite often not even for that long a time, Correct. One day, a very large company in your industry will buy it from you for a huge amount of money. And that is the <laughs> quickest path to wealth creation. Got it. Um, so, Cindy, you said you left the corporate world about 15 years ago. Uh, what was that transition like going from the corporate world, uh, you know, having uh, always somebody to report to, uh, you know, having the luxury of, of uh, a staff, of a space and going out and starting something on your own? Uh, I think you started with make, make love dot porn, if I'm not mistaken. Was that the first? Um, to, uh, actually, um, I started with if we ran the world, and then make love dot porn blew up, and and that became my main focus. But no, I, I have to say, you know, leaving the corporate world was the best thing I ever did in my life, to be frank, That's because great I am now evangelical about working for yourself. Okay. Um, many people make the mistake of thinking that a job is the safe option. Mm -hmm. It's not, because in a job you are at the complete mercy of management changes, industry downturns, marketplace dynamics. I say to people, whose hands would you rather place your future in? Those of a large corporate entity who at the end of the day does not give a shit about you or somebody who will always have your best interests at heart, i.e. you. And so, you know, am I, you know am, I'm, I'm very happy with my past career. But if there's one regret I have, it's mm -hmm. that I wish I'd started working for myself sooner. And so I do recommend to everybody to absolutely decide what you would love to do if you're working for yourself. And by the way, it's entirely possible to start whatever that is while still in your day job. Correct. And, you know, these days, employers welcome that or should welcome that because it is to a company's um, advantage to have employees who are doing, you know, side hustles or side ventures that actually, you know, give them more prominence as people who are do, doing interesting things outside of their business world as well as within it. And so, you know, I am, I am just a huge advocate of ultimately working for yourself. And I think the interesting thing about um, uh, the world we're living in now is mm -hmm. Um, I'm a board advisor to a very visionary company called We Are Rosie. And the reason I agreed to be a board advisor to them is that I met the founder, a wonderful woman, Stephanie Olson, um, mm -hmm. two years ago now. Um, she actually hired me to coach her. And I realized very quickly that she was the future of advertising. Um, we Are Rosie is, is a talent marketplace that she calls the agency of the future. Because okay. what it does is it matches free agents um, with um, brands and clients who want customized teams for specific projects, specific purposes. And by the way, the wonderful thing when a client wants a customized team is that they can absolutely say, I want a gender equal team. I want a diverse team. And we, we are Rosie, we'll put that team together for you or, or find individual people to you know, um, to cover for maternity leaves, sabbaticals, you know, interim CEOs, interim CMOs, whatever, and within, 70 to, within 72 hours. And, um, and uh, um, I refer to free agents because, mm -hmm. you know, the, these are people who historically would have been called freelancers. But, but this is talent today who does not want to be tied down to one corporate role, uh, for whatever reason, you know, wants to, wants to stay um, living in their particular part of the country or the world, right. you know, um, you know, maybe, you know, wants to spend more time with their families. It so doesn't want to be somewhere where you have to go into an office all the time. Um, and, and so this is the ability for brilliant talent to work the way it wants to um, and to be matched with clients who want absolutely the most innovative and creative work. And so, you know, um, all of this is driving the future of work. It's driving a whole new way of working. The pandemic has mm -hmm. proven 
that many more companies can work remotely than they ever thought could, that offices Absolutely. are not the be-all and the end-all. And so um, I think what we are absolutely now seeing opportunities for people to, you know, realize ambitions and take career paths that were not open to them previously. And that's a wonderful thing. It is. And, uh, and I love the fact that you touched upon the future of work as well, because I think we've adopted more digital technology uh, and the right mindset in the last three months than we have probably in the last decade. Um, in, addition, in, in, in addition to the companies now, uh, you know, figuring it out that work can be done from anywhere. Uh, what are the kind of, let's say, the top two or the top three skills that you think any worker that wants to be successful in the future must have? I know you talk about personal branding all the time. So that has to be one of them. Yep. Um, to, uh, um, no, I mean, to, um, to, to be frank, um, you know, it's interesting because um, I, um, I would say that um, to have a really happy and fulfilling and therefore successful work life, mm -hmm. the principles are the same as having a happy and fulfilling and successful life. Okay. okay? Um, and so um, the, 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 um, the most fundamental principle I always start with is everything, everything in life and in business starts with you and your values. And, um, and, and this is really important for both an individual and, and a company. Um, so what I encourage everyone to do, because not enough people have done this, is to take a long, hard look into yourself mm -hmm. and identify what do I believe in? What do I value? What do I stand for? What am I all about? First of all, because when you do that, that makes life so much simpler. Life still throws you all the shit it always will, but you know exactly how to respond to it in any given situation in a way that is true to you. Because the secret of happiness is living your life and working your work according to your values. You know, and by the way, I'm very lucky that working for myself, that is something I do every day. I am living and working my values every day. And the reason that's important to a thriving professional career mm -hmm. is because equally, um, I encourage companies to do the same thing. And by the way, this is the whole point of my startup, If We Ran the World. I encourage companies to equally look into their, themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I'm not talking here about the standard corporate mission statement set of values. I mean, really, look into yourself as a company and ask yourself, what do we believe in? What do we value? Um, what are the fundamental reasons we were founded in the first place? that we may have drifted from in the course of our, you know, corporate life cycle. You know, what do we stand for as a company? What do we believe in? And, and the reason that's so important is, um, you know, I absolutely live my own philosophies. And, you know, just as I was recommending earlier that everybody redesign their business model, mm -hmm. I designed my own business model. Because I believe the future of business, uh, the business model of the future is shared values plus shared action equals shared profit, financial profit and social profit. Okay. And, so, and so what I mean by that is when brands and businesses come together with their audiences, mm -hmm. and by audiences I mean consumers, employees, analysts, any form of stakeholders, board directors, when, when you come together with your audiences on the basis of values that you all share, which, by the way, is the most important requirement for a good relationship in life as much as business. You will never sure. truly bond with someone if you don't share the same values. Agreed. So when you come together around shared values, and when you are then all, when you are all together, then enabled to collectively and collaboratively to co-act on those values, you can then make things happen in the real world that will benefit consumers, benefit society, and benefit the brand and its business. And by the way, if we ran the world as co-action software that enables companies to integrate that business model. And the reason I'm saying this in answer to your question about how do you succeed mm -hmm. in business is because nobody will succeed if they do not work for a company where you all share the same values. Absolutely. And so once as an individual and a professional, you've identified your values, it then becomes much easier to ask yourself the question, am I working for a company who shares my values? Am I interviewing for a company who shares my values? When I look around at the companies I want to apply to, which are the ones that share my values? Because honestly, that is what guarantees most. You will be successful. 
on your career path going forwards. So, so, so that, that's the number one thing that I would say. Okay. Then, um, the, then the second thing I would say is, um, so I am a very big fan of micro actions. Mm -hmm. um, micro actions are very small, simple, easy to do actions. So easy to do, why wouldn't you do them? And the reason I'm a fan of them is because I believe change happens from the bottom up, not the top down. Okay. Every one of us, every single day, taking micro actions to change what we want to see change cumulatively adds up at scale to enormous impact. Agreed. And there's one micro action that I recommend to everybody, and it's a very easy micro action, doesn't require any skills or talents to do it, no experience, but it is the single micro action that will most change and have the most impact on your career and your life going forwards. And it's a very simple micro action, it's just this. Say what you think. No, really. Say what you really think. And the reason I say that, especially by the way, way to women, is because we don't. As women, every day we are man-interrupted, mansplained to, talked over, not listened to, not heard, and in that situation, corporately, in a work environment, it becomes very easy to not say what you really think. And by the way, that happens to men in the corporate world as well. True. Um, the reason it's critically important to say what you think is, first of all, you, know, you are hired for the unique business value you bring to the table. You are not delivering that value if you do not bring your unique perspectives and opinions to the table, to the business. But secondly... Um, quite often, it is only when you start saying what you think that you find out what you think. When you take those um, inhibitors off saying what you think, you gain real clarity as to what your own thoughts and opinions are. And that's important because the third reason to say what you think is because I'm a great believer in be your own filter. If you say what you think, you bring your unique perspectives and insights and opinions to the table in your business. And those insights and opinions are not appreciated, welcomed, valued, championed and celebrated. Get the hell out. Because you will never thrive in that workplace. Got it. And, uh, and, and by the way, um, so again, you know, I, I live my own philosophies. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as you've alluded to and as people will have seen, my LinkedIn bio, my Twitter bio is um, about the fact that, you know, I consult for brands and businesses very selectively, only for those clients and brands that want to change the game in their particular sector. You come to me for radical, innovative, transformative, groundbreaking, I don't do status quo. And so I sum up my approach as I like to blow shit up, I am the Michael Bay of business. Now, I don't do that as a bit of fun, as a bit of creativity, a bit of whimsy. I do that entirely deliberately. Because when I characterize what I do in that way, it attracts to me the people who want what I do. It repels the ones who don't. And I sure as hell want to repel the ones who don't because they're a waste of time, effort, and money. And so I'm a great believer in be your own filter. Because when you project what you are all about out into the world, into the work environment, when you say what you think, when you project your values, you attract to you the people and the companies and the brands who want and welcome what you do, and you repel the ones who don't, and you want to stay away from the ones who don't. Thank you, Cindy. So essentially, if I had to summarize, uh, it would be values uh, you talked about. You also talked about being your own filter and saying exactly what you feel so that you yep. attract the people uh, that you want to work with. Um, switch, and I know that the audience members have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, slightly changing topics a little bit. What is your definition of success, Cindy? Do you consider yourself successful? Mm. So, um, so that's, um, that's a great question because, um, um, you know, th this, is, um, th this is really important. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody's personal definition of success, um, I believe, is first of all, you know, um, are you living and working your values? Correct. And then, um, are you therefore living a life that you find rewarding and fulfilling? Because I don't measure success by, you know, standard old world order measures. Now, um, by my own measures, um, I would say that um, I have not yet been successful 
because um, I am working very hard to scale my startup, Make Love Not Porn, to be the Facebook of social sex. Okay, um, Make Love Not Porn is pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference. We exist purely to make it easier for every single person in the world to talk openly and honestly about sex. In order to promote consent, communication, good sexual values and good sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. And so we're socializing sex. Uh, we are operating globally, but until we have achieved that mission at scale, which means raising the funding to do that, um, we have not succeeded. And okay. so I'm not successful yet in that context of my vision, my mission to make love, not porn, but I'm absolutely successful in that I am lucky enough to be living and working my values every single day. And so I feel very, very happy about doing that. And I feel very lucky and very fortunate. I am absolutely, you know, um, I, I am not um, uh, successful in terms of, you know, um, having made lots of money and be financially secure. I put everything I have into Make Love Not Porn. You know, I'm working very hard to build it. I consult and speak to support myself. Um, but, um, you know, um, in my view, you know, feeling successful in life is about living the life mm -hmm. that you want to live and you feel happy living. And also another aspect of that, that for me is success, is being able to do that for yourself. So that, um, you know, I am not having to answer to or report to anybody in a way that does not make me feel comfortable. Um, many years ago, I read a study on stress in the workplace. And what this study identified was that the single biggest cause of stress in the workplace is not the amount of hours you have to work. It's not the amount of work you have to do. It is when, because of the culture and environment you work in, because of the people you report into, you are not able to do your job in a way that comes naturally to you. Because the definition of stress is having to operate in a way that is not the way you would choose to operate. And when you work for yourself, that is never the case. I mean, I absolutely battle with, you know, I created the hashtag startup stress. But it's remarkably de-stressing when it's entirely up to me as to how I manage that stress. Absolutely. I don't have anybody going, Cindy, you better do this. Make sure you do that. <laughs> you know? And so even though it's very stressful on a daily basis, um, building a startup, um, what is not stress is, is that I get to manage my own stress. And that is wonderfully de-stressing. So essentially stress is inevitable, but you've chosen what stress you want to take in and what stress you want to leave out. Exactly. And, and, and also because, because some of your audience may you know, find this helpful. So um, whenever I'm asked um, what um, qualities I think entrepreneurs need, mm -hmm. my answer is always the same. Persistence, resilience, and the ability to manage your own mind. I've gotten very good at managing my own mind. And so when I have stress coming at me from all sides, mm -hmm. the way I manage it is I go, okay, I am only allowed to stress about one thing today. I've got to pick one thing, okay. and I'm going to stress, and maybe at the most two, and I'm going to stress about those and work out how to solve that one of those two things today, and then tomorrow we'll move on to another one. And so that's how I manage stress in my own mind as well. No, and it seems to be working really well for you. So... Uh, so kudos. Um, Cindy, you brought up the, the topic of make love not porn and it's uh, you know something that you've written about and something that you've struggled with. Um, why do you think that you've had trouble uh, raising funding for it? Is it because we live in such a hypocritical society that everybody does it but nobody wants to talk about it or put their money where their mouth is? Because we have some, sorry, some uh, women founders here as well who are probably in the same shoes as you are. Mm. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's really ridiculous because ever since I launched MakeLoveNotPorn.com in its original iteration 11 years ago, mm -hmm. which was just mm -hmm. a little, you know, copy-only porn world versus real world site, and then turned it into Make Love Not Porn, the social sex video sharing platform, my single obstacle raising funding is mm -hmm. the social dynamic that I call fear of what other people will think. Because it is never about what the person I'm talking to thinks. When you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and make love not porn, nobody can argue with it. The business case is clear. True. It is always their fear of what they think other people will think, which operates around sex, unlike any other area. 
And, you know, so, so here's the interesting thing, um, because the pandemic is make love not porn's time. At long last, we are seeing those barriers break down. And by the way, I very much um, hope that they are breaking down for Indian investors. India oh, yeah, is no. consistently um, our fifth or sixth highest traffic source. Um, I've, been, I, I want, I've been wanting to launch Make Love Not Want India for years. Because, um, so here's the interesting thing about the pandemic. Right now, with everybody in lockdown globally, mm -hmm. um, the world is more in need of love, intimacy, and human connection than ever before. That is being acknowledged openly. We are all at home doing what you do at home. And so I've, I've observed a much greater willingness to talk about sex, acknowledge its reality. Also, people have plenty of time um, on their hands at home to become Make Love Not Porn stars, which is what we call our contributors. Our That's video okay. submission flow has doubled since the pandemic. Okay. Um, our, our revenue sharing business model, which I created to democratize access to income, mm -hmm. you know, um, our members pay to subscribe and rent social sex videos. Half that money goes to our contributors. Now, in a world where, you know, our contributors equally have lost their jobs, can't find work, our monthly payouts are sustaining them through the pandemic. But, but importantly, people are becoming much more open about sex. And so, you know, Make Love Report is not only a pandemic proof, it's a pandemic accelerated venture. We call ourselves the social sex revolution. The revolution part is not the sex, it's the social. And so I'm hoping, and I'm recrafting my investor pitch to take advantage of this moment in time, because I believe that now um, more investors will be willing to fund us than ever before. No, I, I absolutely wish, wish that happens definitely for you as well as for the company. Um, Cindy, you seem like a very driven person. Uh, you know, you bring a, a level of enthusiasm and energy to everything that you do, whether it is social media or whether it is your talks or even now. Um, what is it that keeps you going, even after all these years? So, um, you know, to, um, I have to say, with, uh, with Make Love Not Porn, because of all the barriers that we find, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, um, I always say the dynamic that most motivates me, that will most get me, you know, really fired up and energized, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to censor myself briefly. I won't articulate this the way I normally do, but, but it's the dynamic I call, I'm going to bloody well show you. You tell me it can't be done, I'm going to bloody well show you. You put an offside path, I'm going to bloody well show you. And I want to say, um, you know, especially to the women listening currently, yes. my recommendation um, for the motivation for you to make change for yourself and for the world in times like these is get angry get very, very angry. Okay. And I say that especially to women, because as women, we are not encouraged to get angry. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I absolutely want men to as well. Now is the time to get really angry about the things you've been angry about for many years, because when we get angry, we make shit happen. Anger is a phenomenal motivator. When you decide, as millions of black people have decided in America, you are not going to bloody take it anymore. You know, now is the time to get angry because anger absolutely fires everybody up to break down outmoded barriers, outmoded attitudes, and make the change you want to see happen. Get angry. Okay. Uh, so follow up to that uh, would be Cindy, is anger sustainable? And part two, is it healthy? Oh my God, um, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Okay. Um, because as women, we are angry every day. I know every single woman listening to this will concur with me. Okay. Um, so um, first of all, you know, um, anger is absolutely sustainable because there are so many things in this world to be angry about. Of and course. whoever you are in whatever situation. And then secondly, it's extremely healthy because, you know, um, what is unhealthy is suppressing that anger tamping it down inside, never articulating it, never giving voice to it, and importantly, never letting it drive you to make change happen. So anger is very sustainable, it's very healthy, and the healthiest thing of all is having that anger fire you up to do something about what is making you angry, changing it so that you no longer have to be angry about it. Thank you. Um, Cindy, you work in a very creative profession. Uh, you're coming up with brilliant new ideas all the time. 
you work with a lot of different organizations. What or who inspires you? Where does your inspiration come from? My inspiration comes from every single person who is battling to change the things that we all want to see change. And that means I'm inspired every single day by everything I see around me. Wow. Uh, has there been a specific situation, um, Cindy, and I, I don't think it's probably happened recently, but when you ever felt self-doubt, because I know a lot of people go through that emotion. Where... Oh, oh my God, all the time, <laughs> all the time. Absolutely. But, um, but, but the thing about it is that, um, you know, uh, but, well, uh, two things, actually. The first mm -hmm. is that um, you, you can't afford to give in to that. Decisions made out of fear are always very bad decisions. Um, but secondly, and again, I want to say this especially to women. Um, my dear friend, Thomas Hamoro Premuzic, wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review seven years ago that is the Harvard Business Review's most read article of all time. Okay. The article was called, back in 2013, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? And the point Thomas makes in that article is, we focus quite rightly on the huge amount of barriers that are put in the way of brilliant women all the time. But a much bigger problem is the lack of obstacles for incompetent men. And this article was so widely read that Tomas has now turned into a book. The book is also called, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and What to Do About It? And when you buy the book, as I hope you all will, um, you will see that I have blurbed it saying, this is the single most important leadership book of our time. And it is, it should be read by every single man as well as every single woman. And, and so the important thing for women is absolutely get over that self doubt because you know, over the years in the context of gender equality, mm -hmm. I've had so many women say to me, oh, but Cindy, I don't want to be hired just because I'm a woman. And my response is get over it and look around at all the mediocre men who got hired just because they were men. <laughs> you know, we face a huge number of obstacles that you men do not face because you are the norm. And so incompetent men are able to progress up the ranks into leadership in a way that brilliantly competent women never get to. So women, if you have an iota of self-doubt, get rid of it because my advice to women is, I want you to bullshit like the men do. And I say, to, I say that to women and I say, I feel very confident women telling you to bullshit like the men do because it doesn't matter how much you think you're bullshitting while you're promoting yourself, you will never ever bullshit at the level men do. When you think you're bullshitting, all you're doing is you are finally, in the way you talk about your own accomplishments and what you've achieved, you are finally doing yourself justice. Absolutely. So get rid of self-doubt. And, and like they say that if you've done it, then it isn't bragging. It's only... Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, exactly. And also I say to women all the time, why do you say the word self-promotion like it's a bad thing? If sure. you don't promote yourself, who the hell else is going to? I completely agree. And... Uh, I'm also going to encourage uh, the audience members, whoever, whoever has any question, to please put them in the question uh, and comments field. Um, Cindy, you also talk about women and finances all the time. Um, and I know that that is something that you're very passionate about, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in the personal lives. Why is it important for women to be as financially aware as well? Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Women, mm -hmm. I want you to make an absolute God and bloody shit ton of money. And I say it like that because that's how much money I want you to make. <laughs> and and I, I want you to do that. I want you to set out unashamedly to do that. And by the way, the amount you ask for in a pay review, in a job interview, in a deal is always the highest amount you can say out loud without actually bursting out laughing. Trust me, it works. But the reason for that is I want you to do this not just for yourself, but for all of us. Because first of all, it is critically important, women, that mm. you demand the highest amount of money you possibly can in your pay and performance reviews. Because if you don't, when the leaders of your company look at that giant spreadsheet with all the salaries in the company on it, when they look down that spreadsheet and they see, as they will, that all the men earn more than the women, 
that translates in their minds into that's because the men are better than the women. So you need to equalize that as quickly as possible. But also, I need you to make an absolute goddamn bloody shit ton of money because when we all make that kind of money, we can then fund other women. We can support other women. We can help other women. We can donate to other women. We need to build our own financial ecosystem because the male version is not working for us. And so it's really important, women, that you see making an absolute goddamn bloody shit ton of money, um, not only your responsibility for yourself, but your responsibility for all of us. Well said, Cindy. Um, so I have maybe a couple of questions to go before we wrap up. Uh, Cindy, what is there anything that you'd like to talk about? Uh, anything that you're passionate about? Anything that we haven't already covered? Um, well, I obviously um, want to seize this opportunity to say to your audience, of course. please, uh, to, if you like what I'm doing, please mm -hmm. go to Make Love Not Porn, sign up, subscribe, consider becoming a Make Love Not Porn star. And obviously, if you know any investors or are an investor or a brand that would like to partner with us, um, email good. Cindy at makelovenotporn.com. Um, but otherwise, you know, um, I, um, I, would just, I would just like to reiterate um, what I've already said, which is mm -hmm. now is the time to make change. You know, now is the perfect moment when the old world order is breaking down to make the change happen that you want to see happen. Every single one of you listening to this talk absolutely can in your own sphere of operations. I really want to see all of you do that. Thank you, Cindy. I'm, I'm extremely motivated by this conversation. Uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind, Cindy? How would you like to be remembered? Oh, um, that's very simple. Um, it's absolutely um, um, my legacy through Make Love Not Porn. I want my legacy to be, she changed the way the world had sex for the better. <laughs> very well said. Um, I, I have a last question for you. Any, any suggestions on must-read books apart from the one that you just mentioned? I have an audience member asking. Um, sure. Um, so I highly recommend um, that you read every single business book you can by women. And I okay. say that deliberately because all, too many top business book lists um, are compiled by men and they are dominated by books by men. I guarantee you that if you just search out business books by women, and by the way, that's as simple as Googling business <laughs> books by women, um, you will get completely different lenses on the world, completely sure. different ideas. And by the way, um, because I've been asked for this for years, I am currently working on writing my own. So keep your Very eye nice. out for that, you know, Absolutely. as and when. But, 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 but I really would just say um, that one very simple thing, actively men and women seek out and read business books by women because we come at business differently in a way that will enormously benefit you. No, and, and, I, and I think that's a great thought to end with that now more than ever, different perspectives are so important. Absolutely. Um, diversity, you know, definitely has multiple uh, business uh, opportunities and business successes. So uh, Cindy, thank you. It's been phenomenal talking to you. Um, I wish you and all of your ventures uh, nothing but success. I wish you good health, and I hope that uh, New York City and the United States recover from everything that it's going through, and we, uh, we see the change that all of us are uh, eagerly looking forward to. Thank you very much. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I very much appreciate having the opportunity to have it with you. Thank you, Cindy, and enjoy the rest of your day. I will do. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.